The House of Representatives briefly gaveled into session today, but is still unable to take any meaningful action on the war between Israel and Hamas. And that's because House Republicans still have not chosen a new Speaker of the House more than a week after they fired the last guy. Honestly, they're not any closer to a resolution than they were a week ago. Today, in a closed-door secret ballot vote, the House Republican Conference chose Louisiana Congressman Steve Scalise as their next boss. Scalise beat Donald Trump's hand-picked choice, Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio, 113 to 99. But if you thought that was the end of the protracted fight for the Speaker's gavel, you have not met the current House Republican majority. You see, there was supposed to be a formal vote to elevate Scalise to the speakership about six hours ago. That didn't happen because it turns out he still doesn't have the votes. Even though Jim Jordan, the guy who was running against, and Matt Gates, the guy who led the drive to fire McCarthy in the first place, both back him. In our perfect encapsulation of the Republican dysfunction, we heard from two different House members who refused to vote for him today. Chip Roy of Texas, who thinks Scalise is too close to the establishment, and Nancy Mace of South Carolina, who once proudly touted Scalise's endorsement just a couple of years ago and now claims he's too extreme. Are you worried about Scalise be having been McCarthy's number two? I don't, the... I don't kind of view it through those lines. I will say that going down the road of the status quo is not my preferred option. I personally cannot in good conscience vote for someone who attended a white supremacist conference and compared himself to David Duke. Michael Steele is a former chairman of the RNC. Sahil Kapoor is national political reporter for NBC News. His latest piece is titled, Scalise Brings a Fresh Face, but a Similar Policy Vision as McCarthy, Republicans say. And they join me now. Sahil, let's just talk about what went down today. You've got a vote behind closed doors. How does that vote work? I think it's a secret ballot vote, right? That's right, Chris. It is a secret ballot vote. And Steve Scalise, the House Majority Leader, the natural successor to Kevin McCarthy, beat out uh, Jim Jordan, the right-wing firebrand, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, who, at least in public endorsements heading into this uh, contest, seemed to have an edge. But Scalise, it turns out, had uh, most of the silent members, the ones who don't go on TV as much, who aren't as popular on conservative media, uh, they preferred Scalise. Still, it was a narrow vote. And now Scalise has got to figure out how to get to 217 votes. He's got his own Rubik's Cube here. You know, McCarthy had trouble corralling the majority of the Republican conference, or rather almost every member, as he needed to do every day to keep the job. Scalise has got a, a different and equally challenging occasion, uh, uh, equation on his hands right now. Yeah, Michael, one, uh, one thing that is notable to me, we had this happen with Liz Cheney. Liz Cheney, there was a secret ballot to uh, expel her from leadership. She won that. Then there was a recorded vote, and she lost that <laughs> after Donald Trump. And I just thought it was, it was just, just to, it's worth noting that Donald Trump threw his weight behind Jim Jordan and endorsed him. And in a secret ballot, they did not go with Donald Trump's suggestion, which I think is pretty interesting. Well, it, it just tells you how afraid they are of Donald Trump and, more importantly, his base, who uh, obviously are not happy about this. Um, Steve Scalise is, has more than a numbers problem, in my estimation. He still has a, a policy problem. He has a, do I partner with Joe Biden to, you know, pay the nation's bills problem? How do I help, you know, you know fight against Hamas uh, and stand with Israel at the same time, try to ignore Ukraine problem? So there, there are a lot of other aspects to this, uh, to Sahil's great reporting over the last uh, couple of weeks about how these narratives are starting to unfold. The, the, the backstory drama, Chris, is not the, the who's the head in the horse race for the speaker. The question I hear from a lot of Republicans, what the hell do we do once well, we get the job? That, 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 once he gets it back, you put a new leader in, what do we do? Because well, the base has got them boxed in. Well, that, that gets to a, an important thing. One, one of the things in covering this story we've gone back and forth on is, is there an ask here, right? Is there a demonstrable ask? And there sort of was and wasn't a defund Jack Smith. Not going to happen, right? Um, one of them was, um, we don't like these continuing resolutions that fund the government. We want to go through regular order appropriations process. Right. So that was a big one, to the extent there was like a principled one. And we want these dramatic <laughs> cuts that are below the level that were negotiated right. with, with Biden in the deal. Saw Hill, here's my question for you. My understanding is that Jordan... And Scalise both came before the conference to be like, yeah, we're going to have to sign a CR. We're going to have to do a CR, continuing resolution. Like, So there's already this concession that the whole thing this was ostensibly about isn't happening. 
Yeah, that's right, Chris. It is a jumble. Now, 96% of the Republican conference, remember, supported Kevin McCarthy. Among that 96% was Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan. They both spoke out on the floor just a few feet away from where I'm standing right now, uh, urging those eight rebels not to uh, evict Kevin McCarthy, but they didn't listen. And now you've got a situation where Steve Scalise is, yes, he is you know, winning over some of those rebels who voted to remove Kevin McCarthy, including uh, Matt Gates, including Tim Burchett. But he's got his own problems in other areas. There are some members, you know, who, who uh, have flipped from a yes on McCarthy to a no on Scalise. That includes Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert. They had made their peace with the McCarthy speakership. They both said they're not ready to support Steve Scalise for speaker. And then you have Nancy Mace and Bob Good, who were a no on McCarthy and are still a no on Scalise. There's no one consistent ask here. There's no one thing Scalise needs to do. A lot of these members are beholden to a very conservative base that wants them to essentially do magic to make a Democratic right. Senate and a Democratic president uh, accept very conservative bills that a narrow Republican House might pass, which Democrats are simply never going to. So, you know, how Scalise resolves that, it's, it's very unclear. Most of the Republicans I spoke to today say he shares a governing vision, uh, uh, you know, the same as McCarthy. They're not that different on policy. But the one area where he might have a leg up, Chris, is that he doesn't have the same personality clashes and feuds with people like Matt Gates that Kevin McCarthy does. That is, if anything, his ace in the hole right now. Well, but here's the thing. The, the other part of this, do you agree there's no like actual consistent caucus here or some even a, a governing project that unites everyone, which I think is actually the, the problem at the heart of this, uh, Michael? You know, the narrow majority means that it's been demonstrated you can extract some concessions or you can extract fundraising right. or you can extract TV hits or whatever it is at the margin, right? So so when you've got Chip Roy and you've got Nancy Mace and Bob Good and who knows who else, um, you know, there, there's a few others today. But I thought this was interesting from Ken Buck, who's emerged as a very interesting figure in this caucus. He said mm -hmm. he asked Jordan and Scalise yesterday the flat-out question, basically, who won the 2020 election. And I want to play you what he had to say. Take right. a listen. I asked last night, uh, will you unequivocally and publicly state that the election, the 2020 presidential election, was not stolen? Um, he didn't answer that question very clearly, and Jim Jordan didn't answer that question very clearly. I thought that was pretty interesting. That's an interview with my colleague Katie Turr. And I also think it's like a, a worthwhile exercise to do. I mean, if you're, you know, if people are holding out for, for the votes, like, Good on you, Ken Buck, if that's what you can extract. Well, it's not a question so much of extracting. It's just a question of kind of putting in front of the, the, the body. Look at what we're going to go out to the public with. I mean, we, we, I can't even inside the room get you to say, yeah, it was, st it was stolen. Yeah. No, it wasn't stolen. How, what do you think the press is going to do when, they get, when you get out in public? What does the public say? And that's the problem. You put your finger on a very important strain here. It's governing. The word governing is having not just having a majority. It's having a majority that can govern. And at the end of the day, you can be opposition all day long. You can scream and shout at the rafters all day long. But at some point, the nation's got to pay its bills. At some point, the nation's going to need a budget to pay the bills for next year. At some point, your allies are going to say, hey, can you help a brother or a sister out? Yes. And you've got to it, be prepared to do that. Yes, <laughs> and, and in they're fact, not. And in fact, there's there's going to be a fairly pressing uh, 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 things moving on, on, I think, but probably most likely Israel and Ukraine, Sahel. Um, which is going to ratchet up the pressure. Michael uh, McFall is, is, has been has been saying that as well. Um, what is the status now? Like we were going to have this. It was going to be <laughs> they were going to take the conference vote. Everyone's going to come together. We're going to elect a speaker today. Now we're in recess. We still have Patrick McHenry as as the interim speaker or speaker pro tem who has no actual constitutional authority other than occupying the chair while we wait for a speaker to be elected. So, Sahil, what happens now? We don't know yet, Chris. There are no updates. The House is still frozen. They adjourned uh, for the day. They're back tomorrow at noon. We don't even know if they're going to have a vote tomorrow. They haven't scheduled it yet. It's very simple here. They're going to vote once Steve Scalise has at least 217 votes. Out of 221, we have no idea how long that's going to be. There is a strong sentiment within the Republican conference, uh, nearly unanimous, I, I would say, among the people I've talked to, which is that they shouldn't go to the floor of the House until they have the votes for a speaker and, you know, put, put themselves in the country through that humiliation of 15 ballots doesn't really serve anyone. But, you know, this, this ultimately does come down to Steve Scalise. It will come to, down to Steve Scalise, Republicans say, in terms of when to call that vote. Only he can decide 
you know, when the numbers are there, and only he can tell them, okay, let's go to the floor. I've got it. All right, Sahil Kapoor and Michael Steele, thank you very much. All right.